Good morning, everyone. I am Sharona Hoffman, a professor of law and bioethics here at Case Western and also the co-director of our Law Medicine Center. And we are absolutely delighted to be hosting our annual conference this year. It is called Cognitive Decline and the Law. We have a great turnout. We are really pleased. The room is full here and we have well over a hundred online, I believe. And it's no wonder because we have a great lineup of speakers today. So let's begin with a few words from our co-dean. We have two deans here, Professor Michael Scharf. Thank you, Sharona, and welcome everybody. So usually the co-dean um, who has an expertise in health law, Jessica Bird, would be here to do the welcome, but she's all the way across the country in Houston today. So I am very happy to be the stand-in. Um, so it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to our law school for our annual Law Med Conference. And we're extremely proud of our Law Medicine Center. It's one of the law school's gems. It is the first health law center to be created in the United States over 70 years ago. It's ranked, and it, every year it's ranked among the very top in the country. And our health law journal, and I, and I see our editor in chief there, um, it's ranked third best health law journal, not in the country, but in the entire world based on its citations. So when the authors of the conference papers are being published here, you know people all over the world are going to be taking note. Every year, the Law Medicine Center organizes and hosts a really special first-rate conference on a cutting-edge topic. And this year is absolutely no exception. This year's conference has an extremely impressive lineup of speakers on a very broad range of topics associated with the legal and policy implications of cognitive decline. And having recently had to move my own mother to an assisted living facility because of issues related to this topic, I know from personal experience the importance of this issue and the work that our speakers are doing in this area of law. So we are delighted to be hosting such a distinguished group of speakers and having you, the participants, join us today. I wish you all a productive conference and a wonderful day at our law school. And now back to Sharona. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Michael. So I became interested in issues of aging and disability partly because of a job that I had many decades ago as a senior trial attorney at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Houston, Texas. And there I handled a whole lot of cases of employment discrimination, including age discrimination and disability discrimination. I became even more interested in these topics because of things that happened in my own family and I know that I'm not alone. They happen in a whole lot of families, as we just heard. So I have a book out called Aging with a Plan, How a Little Thought Today Can Vastly Improve Your Tomorrow. And that is sort of an advice book about aging and caregiving issues for a general readership. I think we had flyers out about that. And I also became particularly interested in cognitive decline and have some articles out about cognitive decline and the law. You'll be hearing more about those throughout the day. So when it came to choosing a topic for our 2024 national conference, I thought the time has come for a conference on cognitive decline and the law. And I see a lot of people agree. So I had seen a lot of programs on things like guardianship and surrogate decision making and advanced directives, and we certainly will address those topics today. They can't be ignored. But we also have a very wide range of other topics 
such as cognitive decline and prisons, workplaces, politics, virtual care, research, driving, and more. And I don't remember seeing another conference that is this varied and comprehensive before. So we are so grateful to all of our speakers for making this possible. And we have such an impressive group of scholars from all over the country with us today. Before we get started, I want to thank our IT team for all of their hard work. I also want to thank our director of academic centers, Patty Harbold. I don't, I think she's out at registration, but she tirelessly worked on all of the administrative aspects of the conference. The speakers are nodding enthusiastically. And she tolerated all of my queries and nagging at all hours of the day and night. Our general format is going to be we are going to have 20 minute presentations, usually three of them per session, and then we will leave for, uh, 15 minutes at the end for questions. If you are joining us remotely, please enter your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. We do have someone monitoring the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So I think we are ready to begin, and we are going to start with some scientific background on cognitive decline. So for that, we have Dr. Carol Barnes, who's going to talk about brain mechanisms responsible for cognitive decline in aging. Dr. Barnes is the Regents Professor of Psychology, Neurology, and Neuroscience, and the Evelyn F. McKnight Chair for Learning and Memory in Aging at the University of Arizona. Dr. Barnes' work over the past four decades has focused on the aging brain and on how cognition changes during the course of normal aging. And I am bracing myself for that news. <laughs> Dr. Barnes directs the Evelyn F. McKnight Brain Institute at the University of Arizona, as well as the Division of Neural Systems, Memory, and Aging at the College of Science. She is actively involved in collaborative projects with scientists across the country and the world. She has over 275 publications, a number of which are now classic references on brain aging and behavior. So, Dr. Barnes. One question before we start, how do I move the slides? Um, okay, yeah, all right, good. Okay, thank you all for um, inviting me um, and giving me the opportunity to interact with you and speak about brain aging and cognition today. My research is focused on the underlying brain mechanisms of memory changes during the normal aging process beginning in the mid-1970s before the National Institute on Aging was established. While I started my, with rats as my experimental model of brain aging in, in the 70s, in the early 2000s, I expanded my lab to include non-human primates. And then finally, um, in 2021, I extended my research program to humans for the first time and have been awarded a large grant to, to um, fund an effort we call the Precision Aging Network. Okay. Now, one of the projects, um, one of the projects um, in the Precision Aging Network is to collect cognitive health and lifestyle survey data from the largest geographically representative sample of individuals 18 to over 90 years of age across the United States. And we currently have over 420,000 participants and aim to expand that to at least half a million. We're really shooting for a million people. We collect these data using the MindCrowd web-based uh, testing platform that, that you see um, on the screen. Each blue dot it's not a map of the United States. Each blue dot is a test taker of, the, this, te of this web based testing system. 
And if you are over 18, please go to, to the website on the lower right and uh, take the test. Um, it's only 10 minutes and we always need more volunteers to contribute um, to our study. So that, that's a bit of advertisement here. So um, these, these are some of the current findings from this large data set aimed at capturing memory in a simple paired associates uh, learning task. Um, simply to memorize um, and remember which word is associated with another word that's presented to you. In this task, there are 36 word pairs, which you see along the y-axis. And the, this, these are results from this memory test in individuals between 18 and 90. And in general, this type of memory declines across age, as you see in the um, dark blue line, unfortunately. Perfect performance. If, um, notice that some of the participants actually in the 18 to 20 year old category have perfect or near perfect performance scores, but there's huge variance as you see at each age. And this is a really important thing to keep in mind. But after 70, um, perfect performance unfortunately is more rare. And this is a simple way to visualize the fact that some kinds of memories appear to decline at older ages. Now, interestingly, women tend to be better at this memory task at all ages um, than our men, for which there were hints at in the literature before, but there never was such a huge data set and over such a wide age range. It's very clear you see women in the um, gold um, circles above um, and at every age they tend to be better. Um, on the other hand, men over all ages tend to be faster at speeded tests of reaction time than our women. And this effect is also um, apparent across the lifespan. Notice the men are the blue circles and the lower or, or faster times have lower or faster times than women across all ages. It's particularly uh, noticeable actually at the younger ages, if, as you can see. Because of my early interest in brain aging and memory, I can confidently say that we've made significant progress over the past 50 years in understanding in our understanding of brain aging and its impact on cognition in both normative and disease states. And as a comparison, um, definitions of normal aging often confuse senescent with senile to describe older individuals uh, 50 years ago. So what I'm gonna do is start with some definitions to, um, of normal aging um, to help clarify wh where the field was then and where we are <clears throat> now. Senescent is a word that refers to an organism of old age that carries no necessary implication of infirmity, while senile, on the other hand, is a word that implies dementia or mental incompetence. Dementia describes a range of symptoms that can be caused by specific diseases and results in a decline in memory and other skills severe enough to uh, interfere with daily life. And the most common forms of dementia, of course, are Alzheimer's disease, which has a specific pattern of brain pathology and is gradual in onset. Vascular dementia is, is another important um, dementing illness. It's caused by one or more strokes and typically has a more abrupt onset. So even 50 years ago, the prevailing view of old age was that if you lived long enough, you would become senile. Today, we know that becoming senescent does not imply senility. Neither Alzheimer's disease nor vascular dementia are inevitable. And when I refer to normal or, whoops. When I refer to normal or typical aging in this talk, my focus is on aging of the uh, brain that, and what this means for cognition and health. In other words, being senescent without being senile. So the focus here is on aging brain. What's the brain made up, made up of? I know that there's a wide variety of expertise in the room and not all of you are biologists, neuroscientists, or psychologists. So I'm just gonna go over a few, few basics. I hope you will ride this out with me here. Um, the brain is composed of primarily two types of cells. Neurons is the main, are the main computational cells in the brain. Glia is the major other major support, um, other major cell group, and um, these are the neuron support cells. And then there are vascular cells that regulate blood flow, provide nutrients and oxygen to other brain cells. So current estimates suggest 
about 86 billion neurons and 85 billion glia in your brain. So your brain is really packed full of these amazing cells. So the first question I'll ask is, why should you be interested in normal or typical aging when the need to understand brain diseases of aging is so incredibly pressing? Well, Alzheimer's disease is the main cause of dementia in about 70% of individuals who have dementia, with vascular dementia being the primary cause of, of about 17% of cases. And then there are a, a smaller group of dementias caused by a variety of issues. So for humans, an older adult is considered to be 65 and over. And this cutoff is used today in most studies of aging brain and cognition. So I'll be using that as well. 65 seems far too young to me. As, as you get older, it keeps seem, seeming um, younger and younger. <clears throat> um, so the question is, so how many of us are going to be in this normal, are in this normal category and how many have a neurodegenerative disease causing dementia? So here we go with prevalence. Well, prevalence of a disease is simply the count or proportion of persons who have a disease at a single point in time across a specific population. It's um, an estimate of existing cases. So for dementia, the um, aging demographics and memory study or the Adam study you see there is the first study to produce estimates of dementia in a nationally representative sample across the United States that included individuals from all regions of the country. Prior to this, it was only pockets like from uh, groups in East Boston or you know, not, not representative at all. So this plasmid at all data are summarized here. In the United States, 14% of people 71 and over have dementia of some form. Considering all dementias, Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent, and we've already been through that. So the prevalence of dementia, of course, depends on the age bracket you're considering. If you're just looking between 71 and 79 years of age, only 2.3% of us have AD, whereas if you look at the age range over 90 years, 30% of us have AD. So the actual numbers of people over 71 who have dementia, that 14% is a staggering and horrible number. But you should keep in perspective that even at very old ages, dementia is not found in a majority of people. So another point that's rather is that rather small proportion of us will be demented at the average life expectancy at birth of 74 years for the United States. We've slipped down to 74 years, which is pretty depressing. Uh, compared to other countries. Um, the prevalence of dementia at 74 is 5%, so a very few, few of us will be demented at that um, life expectancy age. A newer study by Jen Manley in 2022 that used the 2016 census data essentially replicates the prevalence numbers of the Adams study that used a randomized sample from the 2002 census data. The Manley study is a relatively large sample of over 3,000 people, and her data supports studies that suggest dementia prevalence has, um, in fact, been declining in recent decades in high-income countries around the world. She also replicated our large, other large studies showing no difference in prevalence between, in, in Alzheimer's disease between males and females. And additionally, her study suggests a higher prevalence of dementia among older black adults than non-Hispanic white adults. So it's really an important study. So the point I wanna make here is that 86% of us over 71 years are in the typical or normative aging category. And this is why we should all be interested in studying um, normative, um, the normally aging brain. Furthermore, I just wanna um, point out that the goal of this Precision Aging Network study um, that I introduced you to, is to define normative aging profiles across age, socioeconomic status, geography, race, ethnicity, um, so that we can eventually have a scientific basis for developing individualized interventions to optimize brain health and cognitive health for that 86% of us. Um, another reason to study this group is that I don't, I don't think that we're going to understand how to treat or prevent the neurological diseases of aging until we understand the 
aging brain onto which these diseases are superimposed. But while dementia is not inevitable, unfortunately, changes in the brain and cognition are frequently reported at older ages. Just like I showed you for the word uh, pair, uh, paired associate memory tests that was administered through the MindCrowd website, older individuals on average do show um, poor memories in some domains um, over time than do younger adults. So let's start to explore what normal brain aging is then. So when I became interested <laughs> In the aging brain and memory, there was limited research on aging and a summary picture of what was in the literature at that time when I first was researching what was known about the aging brain is depicted in this slide. You see a beautiful big cortical neuron from this 20 year old brain. And as you go through the decades up into the 90s, the 90 year old neuron was pictured as being really shriveled and horrible looking, you know. And this is a particularly disturbing picture of brain aging because, as you may know, your neurons are born largely before your birth and die with you at the end of your, your life, with rare exceptions. And not like skin cells or liver cells that, that divide. Neurons do not divide. When they're gone, they're gone. Um, I was shocked at the description of aging at that time, which was you get old, you lose thousands of cells, you become demented, period. And this fact seemed just wrong to me because I knew many older individuals who were anything but demented. But the question of normative aging in the absence of degeneration had not been examined in any rigorous way. We know now <laughs> that this idea... <laughs> is not correct because the data that supported these conclusions were flawed. With newer experiments conducted using more rigorous methods, include, including blinded experimental designs, it's been shown that this depiction of brain aging is wrong. Yes, negative age stereotypes creeped into the early experiments on brain aging, as well as brains from individuals who were uh, had de dementing diseases, which skewed the results. So with respect to rampant cell loss with age, I give you an example from the hippocampus, a brain structure critically important for memory, episodic memory. <laughs> um, we know that the hippocampus, in the hippocampus, there is no loss in numbers of major cell types, not the granule cells, C3 or C1 pyramidal cells uh, across age. Um, and this is um, not in rats, mice, dogs, monkeys, or humans where th these cells have been systematically counted. Now, the reason I'm showing you these examples of the brain structure known as the hippocampus is because the hippocampus is critical for specific types of memory about your day-to-day -day experiences in the world. We know the hippocampus is important because if it is significantly damaged in humans or other animals, memory is hugely impaired, really devastated. So the hippocampus is thought to be a main gateway then to lasting memories in the brain and changes in the structure are a major factor in age-related memory impairment, including spatial memory. I'm showing you here a picture of the hippocampus in a brainbow transgenic um, mouse. Different color fluorescent proteins can be labeled in diff different subsets of neurons in the hippocampus. And I think this is an illustration of where neuroscience and art cross paths. <laughs> Um, uh, over the past decades, we know that all mammals show changes in spatial memory at the age that they're considered to be old. So even in my old rats who are only two years old, that's an old rat, <laughs> who have participated in my experiments show spatial memory changes like older humans, so do older dogs, mice, monkeys, and other animals who have been uh, tested. So one thing you may not know and that you should know is that only humans are unlucky enough to, to actually get Alzheimer's disease. Other animals do not spontaneously get the disease. So the spatial memory that I've been studying in my animal experiments is a result of normal aging in the absence of neurodegenerative disease. So to make the connection between brain changes and memory changes in aging, we need to ask how are memories formed in the brain and how do neurons communicate? So if at least in the hippocampus, the, uh, this memory structure, if there's no cell loss in normal aging, why do we observe spatial memory changes with age? Well, the answer to this question is that many of the changes that impact aging cognition are due to altered connections between neurons. And these connections are called synapses. I'm hoping some of you at least will, will recognize that word. 
Um, but I think it's important that we go through the importance of this in the following. So just go along for the ride if you can. <laughs> so I'm, I'm showing you two neurons here. As we discussed earlier, the neurons are the primary cell type in the brain. Neurons transmit information from one cell to the other via their axon, as you see here. Um, and neurons transmit information from one cell to another via that cell's axon, um, carrying electrical signals down the axon. At the end of the axon, this electrical signal causes synapses to release chemicals across a small gap onto the next cell. And this causes then a, an electrical disturbance in that cell. And, and during aging, while you do not lose hippocampal cells, older humans and other animals do ch show changes in at the synapse, the site of memory formation, and some brain regions um, actually lose sy synapses. So one reason brain network communication is changed during aging is because there's a change in the number or function of between neurons, a change in synapses. So then to make the connection between brain changes and memory changes in aging, we need to ask how, how are memory, memories formed in the brain? Okay. Oops, there you go. Ready? Okay. And um, the famous Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb predicted in 1949 that the alteration of strength of synaptic connections made between neurons is the change in the brain that underlies memory. Hebb's principle has been rephrased by Carlos Schatz as cells that fire together, wire together. Um, but it wasn't until 1973 that a Norwegian scientist, Tede Lomo, discovered the biological process that seemed to fit Hebb's postulate in the mammalian brain. The biological process is called long-term potentiation or LTP. Now Lomo's discovery uh, was in finding a way to measure um, and modify the strength of the synaptic connections between neurons in the brain. So LTP or the strengthening of synaptic connections can be experimentally induced by delivering patterned electrical stimulation to axons that mimic normal neuron firing in the brain. This experimental stimulation effectively results in cells firing together and wiring together. The outcome being an increase in synaptic strength, which you see um, depicted to the lower right in the figure. It's believed that a mechanism like LTP is used by the brain to store experiences. So a reasonable prediction from Lomo's discovery of LTP was that animals with different levels of memory ability may also show differences in synaptic plasticity mechanisms like LTP. And when I studied LTP at hippocampal synapses in older rats, I found altered plasticity or the ability to maintain strengthening in the synapses uh, of the hippocampus. And this change in plasticity mechanism was correlated with how good the animal's spatial memory was. So another way to say this, the more durable um, the synaptic strengthening is at your synapses, the better your individual memory is. So the good news is that cells are not lost in this brain structure that's so important for memory. Once you get rid of a neuron, the neuron's gone, it's not replaced. So that's good news. But synaptic plasticity is changed in older brains, as I've just shown you. And additionally, some synapses are also lost in certain regions of the brain during aging, while other synapses can become dysfunctional, even silent um, during aging. Why am I focusing so much on <laughs> synapses? Well, I believe that if we want to understand cognitive changes with age, we probably need to be concerned about synapse health. All of us need to be concerned. So whatever keeps those synapses healthy and functioning is likely to facilitate circuits important for memory and cognition. We do have some leads about gene pathways involved in synaptic resilience that I'm not going to um, present today, go through those experiments, other than to mention two, prom two promising leads concerning synapse health that, that we're working on. And one is, One is the ability, um, is the activity reg regulated gene NPTX2 that my colleague Paul Worley first cloned and is found in synaptic circuits that are critical for memory. We've found that high levels of this gene in a, in a particular brain area pr predicts preservation of memory in older people, even if these individuals have um, clear pathology in their brain. 
So Paul has proposed that MPTX2 may be part of a pathway that reflects the resilience for circuits critical for cognition. And we're currently involved in a number of projects studying this possible synapse functional resilience factor. And of course, we're absolutely asked about how, how can I increase my NPTX2? So um, another line uh, of investigation include, includes glia, you know, those that other main cell type in the brain and how these cells might pl play an important role in keeping synapses healthy. Well, glia form would have been called perineuronal nets that surround certain synapses and um, uh, may function to protect, protect synapses from damage. And how to regulate these nets also could be an important um, factor in keeping synapses healthy. So we, we found that in that old monkeys with more of these perineuronal nets surrounding synapses do show better memory. I don't want to leave you with the idea that there's a dichotomy in aging and cognition. That is, you're either normative or you're demented. Um, um, I, I want to tell you about a small population of, of older individuals who are not demented and not typical and who, who have memory that is equivalent to those 20 to 30 years younger, referred to as superagers. And there's a lot to learn from these people with respect to brain resilience. A group at Northwestern University first identified these individuals. And to give you an example of how you might notice such people, um, these are scores from a storytelling recall test from 30s into the 80s. And notice that most people fall within the gray shading, which includes the mean and standard deviation of performance. But you see these two outliers, 80-year-old outliers in the red circle these would probably fall into the super aging category. Um, they wouldn't specifically because this is not the test that tests for being a super ager, but I'll tell you what the, um, the uh, uh, specific definition is of a super ager. Person over 80 years of age who has memory performances assessed by the delayed recall portion of a specific test that you see here that's at least at the level of normative values for individuals that are 50 or 60 years of age and um, have at least normal performance on all other cognitive tests, age normative. So when the super ager population, so if you go back, so those two, two individuals, this is a cross-sectional study. That is, you're tested once in time at different ages. But if you follow those two super agers, what you might see is um, longitudinally that is followed repeatedly, they simply don't re decline like typical aging populations in this particular memory test. They're really quite remarkable individuals. So I want to end with um, giving you the full spectrum of what to respect, expect with respect to individual differences in cognitive aging. First, um, those over 71 who are normative or typical, that's 86% of us. Those over 71 who are demented, that's 14% in the U.S. And then those rare individuals who have exceptionally stable memory on some memory tests, even well over 80 years of age. So what does this mean for you? <laughs> well, it makes it a challenge to generalize about what memory in an 80-year-old should be expected to look like. The answer is, as you see, it depends on who you're looking at. And you know, that, that wide variability, the second slide I showed you, even across 18 year olds, you know, you, you really have to follow people individually to know where they started out and, and where they are now at an older age. So what I wanna emphasize for the most part is that normative aging changes are relatively subtle and benign. In fact, um, in normal aging and um, they're not devastating like we see with dementing diseases. So what kind of advice can I give? Well, um, good advice for all of us is to keep those synapses active and learn new things exactly like you're doing now by attending this, <laughs> this symposium. I'm sure none of you thought you would ever want to know what LTP was, but I've just told you that's the basis of memory. Thank you so much. We'll take questions now, um, and we have a microphone, so please wait for the microphone so that people online can hear. Any questions? 
Groups? Senior study with Brass. <laughs> I'm loud. Senior study Brass, do you alter the conditions of the rats, are they all in cages? Are they living normal life? Do you alter their diet? Do you alter their exercise in order to determine if there's a variation? Uh, yeah, all, all of the above uh, ha has been studied. And um, uh, in fact, unfortunately, exercise does not seem to move the bar so much. And that's the same in human clinical trials as well. We all feel a lot better and mood um, is a lot better with exercise, but it doesn't move the bar a lot on cognition. And that's not... Everybody has to keep exercising. It's just, um, it's really hard to move cognition um, with just exercise. But in rich environments as well, it moves the needle a little bit. So of course, environment is going to be important to those factors. So not, not so much a, a question as a comment. Um, in some of the studies we've been doing, looking at the Amish individuals actually in central, central Ohio, we're going around looking at, at some of the older folks. And one woman that we were interviewing was 92. And we're, we're asking him, she's doing very well, right? She's actually fits a super ager um, category. And we're asking her, what does she do all day? And what she does, what she said was, oh, I go out and help the old people. <laughs> I love uh, it. Which we thought was a really, really interesting. It's partly uh, attitude, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, great, great attitude. And attitude may be part of, uh, part of staying active, may yeah. be part of that as well. Yeah. And um, I was talking about this last night, meeting the super, uh, the um, super centenarians in Okinawa, uh, you know, 100, 110 years of age. They stand out as being, you know, having a sort of a, Wry sense of humor and um, being a little bit, I don't know, naughty <laughs> almost, <laughs> and uh, um, helpful to other people in their family because they're sort of the patriarch or the matriarch. Yeah. Have your studies shown any connection between something like multiple sclerosis and the de deterioration as one ages? Because MS, you know, the, the axons that I showed you, because MS affects the myelination of those axons, the conduction between cells can be slowed down. And so I would, I, I'm not sure how many studies have directly looked at um, cognition in, in MS. I'm sorry, I don't know them, but I would suspect that it would be, a lot of it would be just slowing of responses. So, oh. There's new data out that COVID actually affects cognition. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah. And um, one of the main factors involved in Alzheimer's disease is neuroinflammation, and um, the inflammation that's produced in the brain by by that virus is really damaging to 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 neurons neuron function. And we have a number of individuals studying that and showing actual brain structural changes with by MRI and and cognitive changes that occur objectively, not just self-report. Yeah. I've noticed with, I'm a social worker, I've noticed that with some of my patients, there's a very rapid cognitive decline. And with others, you know, once they get the diagnosis, it doesn't really move anymore like so is there a way and i think that's some of people's biggest fear is that like they're going to be one of the people of a rapid decline is there any way would you say like um you know keeping those synapses is, is like is that the same advice you would give to someone who already has a diagnosis or who has like the genetic predisposition to alzheimer's i i you know if you if you have early onset alzheimer's that's that's really fast progressing. So, but the sporadic cases could go on for decades, and things like exercise and and keeping your mentally um, active can slow to some extent the trajectory. And you know what we're trying to look for in this, we we believe that that if you understand what can slow normal age related memory changes, maybe that will help people with Alzheimer's disease as well. So we're looking for those key variables to try to manipulate. Let's wait for the microphone otherwise they can't hear online. 
Thank you. Has there been anything done with polio or observing people who have polio, post polio syndrome, or is the population too small at this point? I'm I'm sorry, I I do, do not know of any studies, but that doesn't mean that there aren't. Yeah. What is the effect of alcohol on the brain, and does that have anything to do with aging? And does alcohol really kill brain cells? <laughs> I hope not after the glass of red wine I had last night. <laughs> you ordered it. I know. Okay, so basically the epidemiological studies say um, that a med Mediterranean diet that includes wine daily is, is um, you know, leads to a healthier outcome co cognitively. And we know, you know that ethyl alcohol is a free radical scavenger. And so some alcohol in your brain or body is going to um, be an antioxidant which protects cells. So some is better and people who abstain also have a, a, um, a less longevity than people who imbibe at least some. But of course, rampant, really oh, horrible binging <laughs> is gonna be bad, <laughs> you know. So, but a little is fine. That is just now being started to be studied. Actually, I, I studied THC early on in my, my career um, on the outcomes of pregnant um, rats and the development of the brain. And the development of the brain is definitely slower in those in rats with, <laughs> that had exposure to THC. And that's been um, verified um, in human studies as well. But we don't know anything on the long end. I don't think. I have time for one more question. I, I, um, I wonder if uh, stress factors, like different stresses or different types of environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, can cause uh, rapid decline. So, yes, um, but too little stress is also bad. So it's this inverted U. You want to be just right here in the sweet spot of not being totally freaked out because Cortisol is bad for the brain. It, it, it influences brain inflammation, but you don't want to be over on that side. You want to be kind of on the top, but you also don't want to be on this side. Um, there's an interesting study um, um, with anti-anxiety medications on older people taking tests. Um, it made younger people worse on those tests. It made older people better because they were a bit too anxious. So I, I think there's evidence that <clears throat> Re reducing your stress level if it's too high is a good thing, but keeping it high enough is also important, which isn't emphasized um, all that much. <laughs>